Hello everybody and uh, good afternoon here from uh, Geneva in Switzerland from the IEC central office. Today we will be talking about best practices for working group conveners and project leaders and with me today uh, is Pierre Sebelin, the technical department manager. Hello Pierre. Yeah, hello Jan, hello. how are you? Very hello everybody. Good. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon. So Pierre will start in a few seconds his presentation. Uh, a few things I want to mention. Um, the, you can find the presentation on your uh, GoToWebinar bar. There you can see there's handouts and in the handouts you can find um, the PDF of Convener Best Practice Webinar and also the IC Code of Conduct. Uh, Pierre will be talking about this a bit later. If you have questions, uh, you can use the questions uh, panel also in the same uh, panel so you can write down your questions and if your questions fit to the content then we will directly talk in the webinar with this otherwise if you have longer questions or some specific questions at the end of this webinar we will have a question and answer section and there we can handle all your questions so I'm happy to start listening to you now Pierre so uh, please start your presentation and uh, let's listen to it Okay, so I'm Pierre Sebelin. In fact, I'm working at the IC Central Office in Geneva. And today I'd like to uh, provide uh, some best practices for the working group conveners and project leaders. Okay, so first of all, uh, some, I mean, general uh, considerations about the role of the convenient project leader. Uh, so this is really an important role in the IC community, either convener or project leader, because in fact effective leadership is really critical to the working group success. To make it very, uh, I mean, summarized, I'll go more in details later on. Uh, the working, the convener are, and the project leader are responsible for calling and sharing meetings. Uh, for the working group and the project team, and they are also responsible for the standardization development projects. The convener and the project leader uh, are expected to have um, a specific uh, behavior there in a way that they are expected to act in a purely international capacity. Uh, they need, uh, they have to divest themselves to any national or, I mean, industrial and market consideration. Um, and they really have to focus uh, on uh, building uh, consensus in the working group. They also need to lead the meetings effectively and fairly. When I mean fairly is that they uh, um, need and they are expected to uh, give the voice to all the members of the uh, working group. Uh, they also are expected to guide delegates and experts towards the consensus and to build the consensus. And uh, they uh, have also to make sure that all views are received and uh, all views are considered with an equal treatment. Some um, just uh, some considerations about the global structure of a technical committee in order to have a better understanding where they fit, in fact, into the global structure, these working group project team and maintenance teams. So in the technical committee, uh, we have, in fact, the chair and the secretary that operate uh, the committee. As per the directives, a technical committee is in fact managed by the P members of the committee because they vote on all the standards and they vote on other, uh, on, um, other decisions like establishing a subcommittee, establishing working groups, nominating people and so on. Then in a, in a technical committee we have what we call ad hoc groups, advisory groups, working groups, project teams and maintenance teams. And we also have subcommittees that have uh, the exact same type of uh, groups and structure and so on. From there, if we look a little more in details, why we have so many groups and what is the purpose of each of them. So a working group first, which we call a WG, a VG, 
So they are intended to develop a set of standards or single standards. And they are expected to be disbanded when they have terminated and done the work. Or also when they are identified as being inactive. A maintenance team is responsible for the maintenance of a set of standards or a single standard. And as maintenance is a never-ending job, an inactive MT will not be disbanded. A project team. So a project team is established when a project cannot be assigned to an existing working group and when the technical committee does not want to establish a working group for a single project. A project team is automatically disbanded at the end of the project when we do the publication of the standard. Then we have advisory groups in a technical committee and a subcommittee. They are established for, for providing advice to the committee. These groups cannot develop standards and they are expected to make recommendations to be, to be further approved by the committee, by the P members of the committee. And then there are other groups. There are short-term groups dealing with a specific subject, like, for example, during a plenary meeting, there is a lengthy discussion about the structure of a new standard or whatever subject. If the discussion becomes too long, then uh, a good option would be to uh, establish an ad hoc group that will deal and discuss the subject and provide a report for the next meeting. Okay, for all the above groups, the experts are nominated by the P members of the committee. And then we have, uh, in many committees, we also have a chair advisory group, a CAG. This is not defined in the directive, the CAG, but they are existing in many committees. And in such a groups, the nominations are usually made by the chair. How are these groups managed? So working groups, they are managed by a convener. It is possible to nominate a co-convener. Maintenance team are also managed by a convener. And it's also possible to have a co-convener. And project team are managed by a project leader. When uh, in fact, when a working group or a maintenance team has several projects ongoing at the same time, then they can, they, I mean, establish an internal structure with several project teams. And then each project team will have a project leader. Um, regarding the nomination of the conveners and the co-conveners, this is made by approval of the P members. So usually they are, the convener is approved at the same time that we approve to establish the working group. And then the conveners, they have uh, terms of office of three years, and then they have to be re-extended, and there is no limit for the number of terms of office. Regarding the nomination of a project leader, the, the name of the project leader is part of the NP form, and so it is approved together with the project. Then I'd like to go a little more in detail um, in the IEC website, mainly in uh, a part of the website that we call the Technical Committee Dashboard. The dashboard is in fact some kind of a mini website dedicated to the Technical Committee. And we have as many dashboards as we have committees and subcommittees. In this dashboard, you will find specific information about the subcommittees, the working groups, the project teams, the maintenance teams, and other groups. So you will find information about the structure of the committee. We will also find a list uh, of the ongoing pro projects, which is the work program. So you will find the work program with all these projects. You will also find archives with all the published projects, so all the previous projects that were developed some time ago by the committee. You will also find a list of all the circulated documents during the past year and some more information. All the information which is displayed on the dashboard is dynamic. This means that we make a query in the IEC uh, information system just at the time uh, that we display it. So this is always up-to-date information. Just to go a little more in details, I'd like to show you um, 
as an example, the dashboard of TC18. So on the main page, you have the, the scope, okay? But you also have the strategic business plan that, that you can look into, and this is, you know, where you have the strategy of the committee. Then in the structure tab, okay, there we can see, okay, the P&O members. We can also see the officers, and we can see here who is the chair with the term of office, who is the secretary, who is the technical officer assigned to TC18, who is the administrative assistant assigned to TC18, and the editor. You can and also see here the list of liaisons for the whole TC, okay? Yeah, and then you can see here the structure. So there you can see that you have a subcommittee, which is 18A, that you have a working group, 33, you've got a project team, and you've got a whole set of maintenance team, and some joint working groups, and an advisory group. If we open, for example, the working group, then we can see here who is the convener and then we can see here the name of all the members and the national committees where they are affiliated to. And you can see here working group 33 and you have the title and you have the task of the working group. So there you can see that you can have a lot of information about the structure of the committee and every time you have a list you always have at the top of the list in the header that little Excel uh, icon that allows to download the list into an Excel file. Now let's go to the Projects and Publications tab. In the Projects and Publications tab, you have first here the whole work program of TC18. So here you have all the projects that are currently ongoing. If we take the projects on the top row, the first line, you see that this is IEC 60092-101, and this is the, edit the edition 5. We have the title, then we have here the stage. This is, it is, uh, in fact, the last document that was circulated, which was the CDV, and you, we can open the files. We have the init date, which is the starting date of the project, so the project started in August 2013. The current stage here is approved FDIS. This means that the CDD was approved to go forward for an FDIS. Okay. And this was done, uh, if we have the date when this was done, and then the next stage is, is the translation of the FDIS. And so this is to be done by March 2018. And then we have the working group to which the uh, uh, project uh, is, is assigned, the project leader, and the forecast publication dates. And we have that for all the programs. Now if we click on the link uh, where we have the uh, reference number of the, of the standard, then we go into the standard. Uh, and there, here we have the whole, into the project, sorry, and there we have the whole history of the project. This was an edition 5, so this is a maintenance project. We see the review report, then the CD, the compilation of comments, so all the, all the documents that are related to the, uh, related to, uh, the project. And here we see on the side some associated documents, because we've seen that the project is rather late, and I guess that there was here some SMB decision to extend the target dates for the project. That's why we can see this here. On the next tab, the one which is called Documents, let's move on Documents, there we can see all the documents that uh, have been circulated by um, uh, the committee during the past year. So you can see here, for example, that there was an RVC, you can download it, you have a circulation date, and then, if you go, for example, for the second document, which is the CDV, the 18-1599-CDV, you can see the documents, you can see when it was circulated, you can see the closing date for the ballot, 
The E here indicates that there is a parallel voting with Senelec. Here you can see this is provisional. If you click here, the provisional in fact gives you the um, uh, results, the vote results for the CDV because the ballot was closing, uh, the, no, the ballot is expected to close on the 25th uh, of May and when you click on that link then the day it's closing you can uh, download the vote results and also the comments. They are available just a few hours after the closing of the ballots. The ballots are usually closing on Friday night uh, Geneva time. And then here you can see the list of the other technical committees that TC18 would like to, I mean, keep informed about that project. And they would seek uh, comments from all these committees about that project. Okay, then, okay, then we have here on the votes tab, you can see all the votes currently on, uh, going on and the ballots currently all opened, in fact, in TC18. In the meetings tab, you can see here information about the last meeting with the agenda and the minutes and about the next meeting. This is going to be in France and you can he you will here will have the announcement. Okay, so this is what I wanted to show uh, on the collaboration tools. And now let's come back to uh, our slides and move to the next one. Okay, so as you can see in um, the uh, uh, technical committee dashboard, uh, we have uh, the, all the work programs with the development of standards. I'd like to spend just a, a short uh, time uh, to remind all the stages uh, that we have for developing standards. And we have, first of all, what we call a pre preliminary stage. And for every stage, we have a set of documents. And first of all, here we have the PWI document, which is circulated to inform all the P members about uh, the, in, the, uh, the fact that a specific project is starting at the pre preliminary stage. Then we have the proposal stage. And at that time, uh, there is a document which is called the NP for the new project proposal form. And this uh, document is circulated. There is a ballot time and then it is voted and if the project is approved then we have another document which is the result of vote for on the NP. So we have the NP a vote and the result of vote. Once the project is approved and in the RVN we have a project leader, we have also some experts to start the work, then the working group starts to develop what we call the working draft, WD, and there, that document is, uh, in fact, an internal document uh, <clears throat> of the working group. And once the working group uh, feels that uh, this document is mat mature enough to be commented by the committee, then they would circulate the committee draft, the CD. And then they open the ballot, and the CD is in fact open for being commented only. It's not voted on a CD, it, there is only comments. And once the ballot is closed on, closed on the comments, then there is the need to send out a compilation of comments. So the compilation of comment is containing all the, uh, the list of all the comments received from the P members. Then the working group will take these comments, will resolve the comments. Resolving means that they would say whether that comment is accepted, is rejected, or is partly accepted. And they would then take all these accepted comments and they would include them into the draft, plus other changes that they think are relevant. And together with all this, they will develop the next uh, edition or the next version of the document. Uh, and when they think it's good enough and mature enough, then they would send that out for uh, ballot as a CDV, Committee Draft for Votes. And that document, CDV, is voted and is commented. So the CD, there's only comments. The CDV, there's votes and comments. And once the ballot is closed, in order to provide information about who voted what 
uh, which national committee voted what and uh, about the comments that have been received. Then we circulate a document which is called RVC, Result of, of Vote on CDV. Once the, that uh, document has been, uh, if the CDV is approved, then the working groups takes all the comments received, once more resolves the comments, integrate the, the resolved comment into the draft and prepares the final draft international standard, the FDIS, which is voted on and then the result of the votes go into the RVD, result of vote on FDIS, and if this is approved, and there there's no comments, and if this is approved, then we go to publication. As you can see, many documents, they go by couple. Together with the NP, we, are, we have the RVN. Together with the CD, we have the CC. Together with the CDV, we have the RVC. And together with the FDIS, we have the RVD. In fact, this is very important. Every time we open the ballot to publicly provide uh, all the, the results of the ballot by circulating the, the other document that contains the uh, results uh, of the ballot. Either votes and comments or only comments. This is important for transparency reasons. Then all the P members, they can see what the other P members have voted and uh, what kind of comments they made. And this is very important to have in the future the standard accepted by the industry and the other stakeholders to operate in a very transparent manner. And once we have done the whole pro uh, process, we end up with the publication of the standards. So just a uh, list of all these uh, acronyms. You see that in the IEC we have some kind of specific language. I will not go in details into this. We have just a set of um, uh, uh, acronyms. Then when we look at that process from the convener, project leader and working group standpoint, we can uh, take out of that process a few key dead, um, deadlines and milestones that uh, the working group has to take care of. First of all, in the RVN, which is the result of voting, Inside that document, there is a set of target dates that are provided in the document. So when the RVN is circulated, it is publicly announced that there is a target date for each uh, uh, key document, like the CD. So you can see here, I made a snapshot of an RVN. You can see that there is stated proposed target date for submission over, and then you've got the CD, CDV, FDIS, and IS. So these target debt dates are expected to be discussed within the working group and provided to the secretary who is in charge to uh, write and fill in the RVN and prepare the RVN and circulate it. So these are the key target dates that, uh, I mean, the, the project leader would, should be aware of. From there, the next milestone is the committee draft. That has to be delivered, uh, delivered uh, according to the target date provided into the RVN. After this, when the ballot on the CD is closed, then there is the need to send uh, to circulate the compilation of comments on the co uh, on the committee draft, and it has to be circulated within four weeks after the ballot closing. And it is possible to circulate unresolved comments. So this means that if you have too many comments and you don't have the time to resolve them, then you can circulate uh, the, all the comments without the resolution in order to transparently make aware all the P members about the comments that were provided. And later on, you can circulate a revised edition that we call an A version with the resolved comments. Then the next milestone is to be ready to circulate the CDV at uh, the announced date and once the ballot is closed then there is also there uh, the, the, the same the result of the voting and the, the resolved comments that needs to be circulated. I'm just saying that I've wrote four weeks I'm sorry this is 12 weeks for an RVC. I'm going to change and revise that uh, presentation sorry about that and then at the end 
there is uh, the last uh, document to be provided by the working group is the final uh, draft international standard, the FDIS, that has to be provided according to the uh, initial target dates proposed. So, if we look uh, there, in addition to the uh, target dates that are set due for, I mean, that specific uh, project, in the IEC directive, there are maximum times allowed to develop the CD, which is 12 months, to develop the CDV, which is 24 months, to develop the uh, FDIS, which is 33 months, and to develop the, um, then to publish the standard, and this is 36 months. And if a technical committee fails to respect either the milestone it has set or these maximum dates, then the SMB will spot the project and identify it as a late project and will request the secretary to provide a justification and new target dates. I mean, most of the time these new target dates and these justifications are accepted, but at least this is a way to monitor the projects and to avoid that some projects they last for 10 years. So here, right, so we can see here the summary uh, every uh, so for every document to be uh, circulated after the ballot closing, the RVN four weeks, the, the CC is uh, four weeks as well, the RVC is 12 weeks, and the RVD is two weeks. Now, let's go uh, for some more specific and practical uh, consideration regarding the preparation of working group, project team, and management team meetings. First of all, these meetings, they can be held face-to-face -face or online. It is highly recommended to communicate to the working group members via the IEC collaboration tools. This means that when you want to send information to your working group members as a convener or a project leader, then it's much better to post the information uh, on the collaboration tools rather than, I mean, keeping your own list of emails and sending emails from your mail system. Because working group members and the list of working group members can change any time, because any national committee can nominate new members or remove members and so on. So if you want to be sure to always send the information to the right people, it's better to do it through the collaboration tools. Working group meetings, they should be announced at least six weeks in advance. You should also provide an agenda. I mean, non it's not necessary to go with such, in such details with a like a plenary meeting agenda, but at least a, a list of items to be addressed during the meeting. And you should also propose and send uh, the related documents you should, the, better, the best thing to do is to post them in advance on the collaboration tools. Uh, it, also, it would be nice to uh, prepare an attendance list and to have that signed. And I, I know that uh, it's uh, what is done almost every time. In the case of an online meeting, then you can make a roll call and then, of course, check the names of the people that uh, are participating at the roll call. Then the collaboration tools should be really the place to store and share all working group and project documents. Regarding the logistic, when uh, you prepare uh, working group meetings, in the case of a face-to-face -face meeting, a uh, working group meeting can be hosted by a working group member or a national committee. So a member could invite, because they have meeting rooms in the company and the facilities where he's working, and so he can offer to uh, the meeting rooms for the meeting. And national committees, they also have meeting rooms, and they can also host uh, meetings. When you invite working group, a working group in a specific country, 
you have to be sure that all the members they can enter the, into the country whatever their what whatever their citizenship okay and so and also as a host uh, you should provide invitation le uh, letters for visa purposes uh, it is not allowed uh, in the IEC it is not allowed to request financial contributions for attending working group meetings in some other cases like in some consortia in, in some standardization organizations sometimes the uh, work the people meeting they part participate financially uh, for the renting of the meeting room in a hotel and so on this is not allowed in the IEC regarding online meetings the central office is providing online meeting services with the GoToMeeting tool and if this is the first time uh, you want to uh, uh, do a, an online meeting then you can uh, you, you have to go through your TCSC secretary uh, to have that um, prepared by central office uh, then later on you can directly contact the administrative assistant of your technical committee at central office and she will uh, plan and prepare the uh, online meeting for you uh, as a recommendation it's not I mean something written into the directives at all but this is from the experience uh, we would recommend that online meeting would last at the maximum two hours uh, this is uh, shorter compared to full day meetings that you can have when you have face-to-face -face meeting but many uh, working groups uh, they end up with the situation and the solution to have for example two hours online meeting during three days in a row and then they would have six hours total meeting by sections of two hours and it it showed to be quite efficient because then it's also not taking the full day of work for the people engaging into uh, standardization okay also uh, technical committees and subcommittees they have liaisons and I'd like just here to have a short discussion about how to handle these liaisons within a working group or at a working group level first of all we have what we call liaison A these liaison A are liaison made by the technical committee with external organizations like consortia like IEEE like other SDOs and in, when there is a liaison A established, then this organization, which is in liaison, can nominate experts in working groups. And there, the experts that are participating to the meetings, they are expected to bring their own experience and knowledge, just like any other expert that is nominated by a national committee. When we have a liaison D, which is also another type of, this is another type of liaison with uh, an external organization that the liaison can also nominate experts but in that case the expert that is nominated is expected to represent the position of the organization in liaison so then that person is not expected to really bring his own personal opinion and position but is expected to have discussed the issues uh, before joining the meeting with uh, his organization and he's raising the voice of the organization in the meeting regarding uh, the other liaisons because technical committee they have uh, quite a few liaisons with other IC technical committees or with ISO technical committees these liaisons are at the uh, committee level and uh, it is not expected that uh, experts from committees in liaison attend working group meetings. They are only expected to attend plenary meetings. Anyway, the working group convener can invite guests to his convenience. So the working group convener can invite any guests he wants. What we recommend is that if we have guests, then the other members of the working group should be aware in advance that some guests uh, will be attending the meeting together with them 
Also, when you prepare a document in a working group, you should also try always to have some kind of a wider vision about who or which other technical committee could be concerned or impacted by the standards you are writing. And if you feel that another technical committee is impacted, you should inform the secretary when you send your uh, drafts and your documents to the secretary for circulation. So always try to think out of the box uh, about uh, which other committees could be impacted by your work. Another very important task of a working group and we, a task which is, which is made during working group meetings is comments resolution. And so that important uh, that activity uh, requires a good preparation before the meeting in order to efficiently efficiently uh, process and go through all the comments and resolve them. So when you receive the comments from central office, they are sorted by national committee. So you will have all the comments from one national committee, then from the other from the other national committee and so on and so on. But in that table, you also have line numbers. And this is the line number to which the comment make reference to. And so the first thing to do is to sort all the comments by line numbers. And then you will have for a given line or a given expression or statement or requirement in a standard, you will have all the comments from all the co committees. This is, uh, of course, much more helpful to make a, a, an efficient resolution. Before, I mean, uh, having the meeting to discuss the comments, the convener or the project leader should go through all these comments and prepare draft resolutions. So basically, the you know the comments. Uh, there are uh, there are three types of comments. We have call editorial comments, we have technical comments and general comments. So the good the, the good practice would be to first go through the editorial comments and check whether they are really editorial, a typo or something very obvious, and then just mark them as uh, approving the result the result I mean being approved and accepted these comments. Then when you have general and technical comments, uh, you should check into them and the ones which are obviously justified and that should obviously be accepted, then you can already draft an accepted resolution uh, on, the, uh, on the resolution column of the... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, let's go back. So then we have these resolutions, and then we have uh, all the other comments. I mean, there's technical, even editorial or general comments that uh, you think needs a discussion, then you can uh, mark them as to be discussed at the meeting. And these are to be considered as draft resolutions. And once you have done this, then you, could, you should send that uh, these comments and their draft resolution, send them to the working group member, members enough in advance, allowing the working group members to be to come to the meeting and be prepared. So if, if you have two pages of comments, a few days in advance is okay. If you have, I mean, 50 pages of comments, you need at least two weeks in advance. Okay. Of course, when you uh, during the meeting you uh, de develop the consensus about the resolution of the comments, then you should, uh, of course, have a fair attitude and fairly consider all the comments, all the uh, oppositions from the members, and try to develop the best consensus. So, for the operation of the working groups, uh, central office we offer some support to do the to, to you and uh, we have first of all 
uh, the technical officer. So the technical officer is uh, intended to provide support on the application of the directives. When I mean application of the directives, the technical officer will help you, uh, I mean, and help the technical committee when they want to nominate people, establish a new working group. Uh, so about, gen in general, about the operation of a committee, how to shape the committee, create subgroups and so on, other groups, whatever, how to nominate conveners and so on. Uh, he will also help about the liaisons and also about the preparation of the plenary meetings and is also providing help about project management rules. So if you have questions about what's the next stage, what should, what should I do next in my project and so on, then the technical officer can also help you there. The administrative assistant is working also as a team together with the technical officer and she is there to provide support to circulate all the documents. So when, you have, when there are documents to be circulated, then this is the administrative assistant that checks the forms, checks that the document is at the proper format as well, and so on, and that all the deadlines are okay, and so on. So, and she's opening the ballots, she's uh, uh, setting the deadline for closing the ballots, and so on. So this is what the administrative assistant is doing. And the administrative assistant is also working uh, with GoToMeeting, and she is uh, re registering the online meeting and she's opening the online meetings and then giving the hand to the convener of the meeting. One thing important is that for the central office, the primary contact is the technical committee or subcommittee secretary. Because the secretary is the person who is formally responsible for the content of all the documents that we circulate to the team members of the committee. So, uh, basically, an administrative assistant or a technical officer will not accept a CDV directly from the convener or a project leader. We will accept it from the secretary. Even though all the work is done uh, in the working groups, uh, the secretary is the person that has the formal responsibility for the content of the documents, and this is from that person that we expect to receive it. Okay, then also, so we offer services for the web conferencing. Uh, we also have the IC standard template, which allows to properly format uh, the standards, and that, that uh, should be used at the earliest stage of the development of a publication. We also do at Central Office the editing of the CDV and also the FDIS. And uh, when we have edited the CDV, we send it back to the secretary for being forwarded to the working group, and the edited CDV should be the base for the development of the FDIS. There is also a specific support section about drafting IC publication on the IC website. You have the link here in that presentation, and I would like, I really invite you to dig into that part of the website. If you want to know how to, I mean, for example, define terms and definition, how to handle dated and undated references, normative references, how to write equations, and so on, for example, you will find help here in that part of uh, the website. And, and finally, at Central Office, we also uh, offer training services, mainly via the IEC Academy, and for example, these types of webinars. Um, before, um, I mean, um, um, yeah, before I move on another subject, uh, I'd like to um, just mention to you the IC Code of Conduct. The IC Code of Conduct is a brochure that has been written uh, by the IEC and that uh, provides guidelines on issues which delegates and experts may be confronted with as participants in IC standardization process. So, it includes uh, consideration about antitrust, anti-competition issues, about how to talk uh, about your uh, standardization work in social media, about issues on patent rights, about copyrights, and so on. 
And so it also talks about the general behavior uh, about consensus and mutual respect that is needed in working groups. And so if as a convener or project leader, you have problems with some experts for, I mean, reasons from uh, like uh, attitude problems and so on, that they are not really well open or doesn't really uh, work to develop the consensus. Uh, I really invite you to um, check into that code of conduct and invite you to provide this document. This is this, this is a PDF to provide it to the people and uh, to all the experts in the working group, and to you can really. Uh, take what is uh, said into that document as a base to help you, uh, uh, I mean, go around some specific in a, inappropriate attitudes. So if you have these kind of problems, you can have a look into the code of conduct. Okay, so now I've been through uh, all um, uh, all the slides and I've been through all the subjects I wanted to uh, address today um, and now the floor is open for questions. So uh, do you have uh, any questions regarding what has been presented? Ah. Hi Pierre. Um this is Jan. I don't see any questions so far, which is interesting because uh, the session this morning had so many good questions. So it seems that uh, today all content is well understood, I guess. Oh, there's one question from Stephen Kanze. Um, you told that the week... Maybe was a... hmm? Right. Go ahead. Uh, Stephen Kanze asked, you told that a working group can be organized into PTs. Who's responsible for that organization? So the convener of the working group is responsible uh, for the internal structure of his working group. Uh, now, when we, the P members they approve an NP for a specific project, in, in such a case, into the NP form, there is the name of a project leader. And so that project leader is the approved project leader. So at least you have, and you need anyway, when you are a convener, you need to have a project leader. Sometimes the convener is also the proposed project leader. But for each project, we have an approved project leader. So this is the person who's going to be in charge of moving forward that specific project. And otherwise, effectively, effectively this is the decision of the convener how to organize the working group. Okay. So we have a short question by Ivanka Atusonava Höhlein. Where can I find the presentation? So the presentation you can find uh, here in the uh, go to webinar pane on the right hand of your screen. And uh, here we have uh, the handouts and here you can download the, uh, the PDF of the presentation Pierre just gave and also the IEC code of conduct which has been mentioned uh, right now. Uh, more questions are coming in, Pierre. So we have Ivanka also asking, where can a project leader find all addresses and emails of the members, not only the names? Hmm. Yeah, this is an interesting question. This is an interesting question. Um, then the best place to find it is uh, in the uh, uh, collaboration uh, in the expert management system. So I can show you this uh, basically we go to uh, okay the IC and we go to the expert management system so I hope that everybody knows what is the expert management system and this is the place where you can find your old profile so for example uh, and there in the expert management system you have here a technical a list of technical committee so I would select technical committee 18 which is the one I showed as an example here. And in technical committees, when I have selected 18, then I have the sub-entities. And I can select here the working group 3, that, uh, no, 33, for example. And then I click on the list all button. And there, in the expert management system, 
there in that place I see the function, the last name, the first name, the national committee and the mail address. And from there I can go to Excel, open with Excel. Yep. And I have here my Excel file and you can see that even in Excel I, know I, I have even more information because I have the last name, first name, the national committee, the email. I also have the address, the postcode, country code, fax and so on. In order to access to this you need to uh, have logged in. Okay, so you need to log in and to have uh, given your username and password to access to this. And once you have this, you take here the column on email, you copy you copy this and you paste that into an email and then you you can have the mail address. But there you have the mail address. So this is through the expert management system. And this is why in the expert management system here, this is why it is important to uh, keep always up to date your email for your own profile. So if I go, I click here and I, I make a search by them, S-E-B-E-L-L-I-N, which is my name, Pierre Sebelin. I make a search on Sebelin. And then I find here myself. And then I can open here my profile. And there I can see my mail address. And that I can change it. And this is the key information that I, as expert and member of the ICF community, that's the key information you have to keep up to date in your profile because this is uh, the way the IEC will communicate with uh, all the experts. Okay? I think I've answered in details. I hope uh, that answers. Okay, thank you, uh, Pierre. We have another question. If CDV has been accepted, is it possible to circulate another CD or CDV and not FDIS? From uh, Janan Neumann. No, unfortunately, our, di our directives require that once the CDV is approved, either the document is published or the document, uh, I mean, goes through FDIS and is then published. So this is mandatory. Okay. Now, if you have an excellent and very good reason, uh, you may ask to the standardization management board to make an exception because the SMB is always if the SMB is approving uh, the directives and the SMB has also the power to allow technical committees to do exceptions to the directives. Okay, so if there are really very good reasons, then uh, you can uh, you can ask to have an exception to the SMB. But well, this is not done very often. Okay, uh, John says uh, thank you. Then we have a, qu a question from Domenico Festa. What about translation, for example, in French? Here I don't know where this is related. Pierre, do you want to say something about this? Right, okay. So, in fact, the translation in French uh, is made uh, at the CDV stage. So, when the central office receives the draft in English, the CDV draft in English, then the central office sends that English draft to the French National Committee and asks whether the French National Committee is willing to translate the document. Okay? And then uh, if the French National Committee is accepting to translate the document, then um, the then we will work with bilingual documents. At the CDV stage, there is always a six weeks time period allocated for translation. This means that when we receive the document, the draft CDV in English, we do not open the vote right away. We wait six weeks for translation before opening the vote. This is not only for France, but this is also the, uh, due to the fact that in many countries there is the requirement, uh, a national law that requires to have 
public inquiries uh, of, uh, of standards for some cases. And for example, in Germany, they are required for all the European uh, standards. So the, the standards that we do in parallel vote with Europe, with CENELEC, uh, they are required to make a public inquiry. And the public inquiry has to be made on a, with a document in German. So basically, many countries, they are required to do public inquiries and they need to translate the CDV into their national language. So this means that even if, if France is not translating the document in French, we still keep the six weeks translation for this uh, need of national inquiries on CDVs uh, to be made with documents in national languages. Thank you. Here I have another question from Domonico Fester, the same person. Translation should be ta uh, taken place after CDV, but timing is very short, isn't it? I'm sorry, I didn't understand the question. The, the, usually the translation is made uh, uh, between the moment uh, when we receive the CDV at central office and when we uh, uh, circulate it and open the ballot on the CDV. I think he was commenting that the that the translation time uh, for the CDV given to the national committees would be too short. Ah, huh. but okay, this is uh, this is something which probably uh, well. I mean, the, this this six weeks uh, uh, period is has been approved by the SMB, and we do not decide at the central office about these rules. We just apply them. And if there is a need for longer translation periods, then, uh, I mean, the rule has to be changed. And the way to change the rules is to go back to your national committee and complain about the short time and ask whether they would support to go to the SMB and request to have the uh, time period extended. But basically, the directives are decided and approved by the, the, the SMB. Uh, so the standardization management board where all the uh, member countries vote and approve this and so uh, once this is approved by all the countries we just at some point of this apply these rules okay very good then we have a question um, from Serge Noel during a working group meeting when there's no consensus achieved uh, when does a convener organize a vote huh. It's, uh, uh, usually, you first organize a coffee break, and then you try to organize a vote back from the coffee break, because that's the best place to reach consensus. But that's definitely, uh, I mean, uh, a very good question. Um, uh, when you have, I mean, contentious subjects, and it is very difficult to uh, reach consensus, okay? Uh, I think that uh, when you are discussing about a contentious subject, this is of course the role of the convener or the project leader uh, who is chairing the meeting to try to bring all the people uh, to the same, I mean, to a position where they would, ac that they would accept, okay? Consensus is the absence of sustained opposition. So you have to try to find, I mean, a, a statement you have to try to find a formulation uh, about the requirements. So you have to find the requirements that uh, can be accepted by uh, the members around the table. And if you, um, I mean, if you see that there is no possibility to have consensus, then uh, to have, a, I mean, to have a, that consensus, then you may, you have two options. Either you remove that statement and that requirement from the standard because it looks like it is not mature enough and not co consensual enough to go into a standard or you go for a vote and then you take the majority and you move forward. Uh, apart these two, so in fact, uh, the I mean, usually this is really the last uh, solution to go for a vote and have people raising hands, okay? If you go for a vote, you have to be a little formal and make sure that all the observers and the guests are not voting 
and that only the registered members, uh, that the people that we have seen in the list on the IEC website, these are the registered members, these are the ones that can vote. Okay, thank you. I hope I've uh, an, uh, answered the question. We have another question uh, from Ingo Arnich. A question to the attitude of working group members. One member often refers to the consensus required within a meeting, but has a specific understanding of consensus. He insists on a 100% agreement of all present members and tries to block decisions. Where can I find a written meaning of consensus within IAC meetings? This is in the directives, and it is stated clearly in the directive that consensus doesn't mean unanimity. Uh, so, I don't know exactly the page in the directives, but you can open the directives uh, part one uh, and then make a search on the, on the word consensus and you will find the definition of the consensus. Yes. Um, I, I just, in the meantime, I had a look. Um, this is uh, on the directives part one, page 30 in the current edition. And it says a general agreement characterized by the absence of sustained op opposition, as you said already, Pierre. So you find it in the directives, and uh, I think if you show this in the next meeting, uh, this would be clear then. Mm -hmm. And also, if you go into the brochure about uh, the code of conduct, you will also find again uh, the definition of the consensus, which is the exact same one than the one extracted from the directives. Very good. One comment uh, again from Domonico Festa. What about consistently inactive members? Hmm. So, consistently inactive members, they have to be identified by the convener of the project leader and that they are reported to the secretary. So, you should report to the secretary of the committee the inact that you have inactive members. From there, the secretary will contact the national committee and will try to will just inform them and ask them whether, uh, I mean, to take any necessary actions to have these members becoming active. If that has no effect, then the secretary escalate, escalates this to the technical office at central office. And we again ask to the national committee to be active and to, to, to take any actions um, to have this person becoming active and if after, I think this is four or six months, nothing had changed, then the central office can by authority uh, uh, decide and remove that person from the list. So there are several stages <laughs> to uh, remove, but at the end of it, I mean, we can remove these people from uh, the list of the members of the working group. Okay. Any other questions? So at the moment there are no more questions. Um, this said, of course, you can uh, contact us uh, per mail if you have other questions related uh, for your work as a as a convener. Um, so yeah, Pierre. At the moment, I don't see any any other questions. Right. Very good. And otherwise, I think we've already spent the allocated time uh, for this webinar. So I really uh, want to thank everybody for having joining us for this webinar and for having stayed with us for the whole uh, hour and for your attention. So thank you very much for your attention and thank you, Jan, for your help uh, for this webinar. Thank you, Pierre, Bye -bye. for the great presentation.